This is Leave Your Mark. I'm Vince Cortez, and today's guest is Stephen Tinkle. Stephen is a seasoned professional with over two decades of experience in various fields, including technology, business, strategic planning, marketing, and professional development. With a passion for demystifying success, he has worked with international athletes, NASCAR, Major League Baseball teams, startups, and even contributed to a New York Times bestselling book. Stephen's dedication to helping entrepreneurs and business leaders smash through the barriers and achieve their goals makes him a valuable asset in the world of business and personal development. He is my guest here today. Stephen, thank you for coming by. I'm glad to be here. Hopefully I have something useful to share with your audience. Oh, you do. You do. <laughs> Indeed, you do. Hi there and welcome. Now it's time for America's, America's favorite, podcast. favorite podcast. Leave your mark with your host, Vince Cortez. If it's fly, loose fit it. It's Cortez. If freeze and chop is in it, it's Cortez. Leave your mark. It's about inspiring the world. One guess at a time. Pass the word from Brooklyn to Pittsburgh, from urban to suburb. It's Cortez, you heard? And here is our host, Vince Cortez. Well, I mean, you're a, a cancer survivor, and it's something in which we'll, we'll talk about it a little later. But I want to share with the, with the listeners where you're born and raised and what life was like. I was born in uh, Freeport, which is just an oil town uh, somewhere on the coast in Texas, which I've never been back. And uh, I was raised in East Texas, specifically like Nacogdoches uh, Center, kind of that area. Very colorful childhood, maybe is a good way to say it. It's interesting in retrospect describing your life. You know, how do you how do you perceive it and how do you describe it versus what it was like living it? A little bit of chaos. I lived in 21 different houses by the time I was 17 years old. So there's a your, lot of your mother, um, Monty, she was uh she worked in auction houses selling livestock. So you're in Texas and yeah. your dad was uh um he owned his own tire store. So yeah. uh, you have a sibling. Share with me your siblings, Shane, Lindsay, and Wendy, and what life was like with your siblings. Yeah, so, you know, I had a, a younger brother. He was about two years younger than me. You know, it was kind of a typical younger brother story. You know, he was annoying. He copied me all the time, went everywhere with me. And, you know, what are siblings? You don't really know. You know, they're just there. But unfortunately, uh, there was a tragic accident. I was eight. He was six years old. We were getting off the school bus uh, and he was hit by an 18 wheeler who did not stop for the school bus. And so it was something that I, I witnessed probably 40, 50 feet away from me. And then I had the unfortunate task of having to tell my mother that that had happened. And, you know, it was one of those memories where I remember every single moment, you know, as time slowed down, I remember like running at books in my hand. And I thought, you know, I could throw them down and run faster. But we had this uh, stray dog that we had named Felix. And I thought, if I throw them down, he'll eat my homework. And then I'll have to explain to the teacher that the dog ate my homework. And I know that was a bad thing to say, but I didn't exactly know why. But in my case, I thought he might actually eat it. And I don't want to explain that. So I probably should just hold these books and keep running. You know, and then, as you can imagine, that was a pretty chaotic, you know, traumatic event in your oh, life. Word, especially, yeah. at, especially at eight. You know, to, one to have witnessed it and then had to, you know, tell her and then, you know, just to process all that as a kid. It's one of those things that's really foundational and has stayed with me, you know, throughout a lot of my life and, and was formative in a lot of ways. One of which I, I credit my curiosity to because I needed to understand and make sense of that situation. And the tentacles reached out into almost every aspect of my life. Now, how did this affect your childhood in your house? Do you have a stepfather at this point or? Not yet. Um, at that point, it was just my my mother and, and myself. So, you know, now, I mean, technically, I'm now an only child, I guess. And then my mom is a single mom, you know, raising one boy instead of two. And I don't know if he was in her life at that point, but uh, it was around, I was around fourth grade, I think, when they got married. Um, where I was in second grade when uh, I, I lost my brother. Probably uh, she knew him at that point. And then, you know, it, I, I try to see the event, you know, through everyone's lens and for hers. I mean, moms love their kids, you know, and to have your, your child taken from you literally in your front yard. I just don't know how you recover from that. And I feel like, 
maybe she didn't. I think the emotional trauma of that, I'm not sure that she's ever fully recovered from. You know, just as I observe. Now you're still life. in your youth here. So um, as you get older, uh, you're going to Wooden High School. And mm -hmm. how is life progressing? I mean, because that's like life stands still and then it has no answers, as you just said. What's the progression of life now into your teenage years? Well, I mean, as an awkward country boy, you know, from East Texas, you know, I, I was going to a, a bit of a bigger high school at the time. And then we moved like really not very far from town, but there was a weird districting thing. And so I ended up having to go to this smaller, like a little 1A school. I think there were 30 people in my entire graduating class, you know, and, and so any of the like advanced topics, you know, we had studied in high school and they didn't offer those at Woden. And then, um, you know, because it was so small, I got to be on all the sports teams, even though my job was more bench warmer. I wasn't really good. In sport. <laughs> uh, but they needed now, people. So we filled the roles, you know. Now, I mentioned that. So you played sports. What other interests and activities did you have? I think I've, you know, I've always been like a varied interest. Um, I think they their term you'll hear on social media now is like neurodivergent. I didn't know what to call it back then. I know I was undiagnosed with ADD, ADHD, where the, the ability to focus is incredibly difficult. And I didn't know how to manage that at the time. But so easily bored, I moved from thing to thing and I felt like I was able to master a lot of them. You know, as I think back, uh, I did some woodworking stuff, which has honestly really stayed with me my whole life. I really enjoy that because it's the stuff you do with your hands and um, also have dyslexia dyslexic people are usually they, they need to do things with their hands and so that's been present in all my activities like i got into archery at one point i found this old beat up bow that probably was dangerous and shouldn't have been using but i would just go outside and you know shoot a bow and arrow and practice and try to get good at that and, like being outdoors no yeah, you, being outdoors um, for sure you graduate high school and you go on to uh college and you're at Texas A&M University. Now, did you go there originally or did you transfer to t Texas A&M? Oh, well, originally, I was kind of recruited by some engineering schools. I, 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 it's what I remember in high school. The guidance counselor came and talked to us and they, they said, you, you're going to take the ACT and that'll help you decide what college to go to. If, if you get a 15, you can go to like a community college, state college. If you get an 18, you can basically go to any college in the country. 21, you start getting scholarships. And then 23 is like whatever, full ride kind of stuff. And if I recall correctly, I think I got a 31 on the ACT. Oh, my. And then, well, you know, so then all these schools are. Based like, on hey, what come, you were saying here. there earlier with some of the learning deficiencies you had, you wouldn't expect that a 31. No, I wouldn't have. And then so I got this guidance counselor that said you'd make a good engineer. So I started telling people I'm going to be an engineer and then they would ask, well, what kind? I'm like, I don't know. I just learned that engineering was a thing, you know? So in, in East Texas, you're pretty sheltered from a lot of what goes on in the world. And so I didn't have a basis of comparison. Like my stepdad worked cattle for a living. Mm. He was a professional cowboy and he would shoe horses for a living. Wow. My nights and weekends were horse shows and rodeos. Um, I probably have, 600 trophies, you know, when I was a oh kid my. that were all just up in a barn, you know, where our, my mom was into horses. And so I did a lot of, you know, the, the horse shows, they, you know, I, I was probably at one every weekend. And then I sometimes would do rodeos till two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Well, so you also uh, attended Embry lifestyle. Riddle. Uh, your, uh, now that's Aeronautical that was, uh, University. Now, how did you yeah. study aerospace? So you jumped, so you went into being well, an I got aerospace this, engineer? Yeah, I got this thing in the mail that they said, hey, come come to this college. And it was in Daytona Beach, Florida or Prescott, Arizona. And I said, well, Daytona Beach sounds like the easy choice. And so I started studying air at the time. It was aeronautical engineering. And then they switched it to aerospace engineering. I remember one of my professors explaining something once. And he said, guys, come on. It's not like this is rocket science. And he's like, wait a minute. Actually, <laughs> yeah, actually, this this is rocket science. <laughs> 
Now you graduate but then. then yeah. So you're getting out into the real world. So you're coming up at age 24. And what happens to you at age 24? Well, to clarify a point, at 24, so I transferred to Texas A&M University. I was studying aerospace engineering and then switched to the business school. And then uh, my girlfriend at the time said, sit down, we need to talk, which is not a good way to begin a conversation. And my first question to her is, are we pregnant? And she said, yes. And so then I knew, like, I, I have to become a responsible adult and I need to start making some money and provide for my, my new child, which in that moment, I could feel it and I could see a vision of a little girl running through a field of flowers with long brown hair. And I, oh, and wow. I told her, I said, everything's, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be a girl. And it ended up, that's true. She is a girl and she has long brown hair and I have seen her run through that field of flowers. Oh my. And so and their name's the Ilsa, time, was, right? Yeah, Ilsa. Okay. Uh, and then you have a son so, also. Yeah, my son Stoker was born about 13 months later. And so I started working, but I I'm you know, and this this was hard for me for a very long time because I didn't know how to handle this either. So I never finished college. And my uh, transcript is probably one of the worst ones you've ever seen. <laughs> I just I was not wired for school. And so there was this chip on my shoulder that I had to prove something to the world that I was, I was not good enough that I somehow, you know, could, I wouldn't be accepted in certain places or certain jobs I couldn't even apply for. And so I worked extra hard to learn and grow and gain knowledge and to try to be the best version of me I could, because I felt like I had to overcome something to even have a chance in the world. And so there's like this sheltered bubble in East Texas where, you know, like my stepdad, his friends were like, uh, you know, firemen and other cowboys. And there, there weren't doctors and lawyers and engineers like we, that vocabulary wasn't even in our house. Hmm. And so, I mean, I'm trying to understand the world. And so I, I took a job uh, working in tech support, you know, with a company that wrote software for the insurance industry. Um but meanwhile, doing things entrepreneurially on the side. So I've got a computer in 1991 and I learned programming. I fell in love with video games. You have to share with me the type of computer it was because you, you we're going to see a smile come across your face. Oh, it was, it was a big deal. Like at the time, um, the 386 was a dominant computer and the 486 had just come out. And people would say, like, hey, do you have a computer at home? Like, yeah, I do, which no, not many people had at the time. And then they would say, what is it? And I'd say, it's a 486. And they're like, really? Like, that's too much power for a person. Like, that belongs in a business, you know? And so it was it was so speedy. A lot of times, you know, games and programs wouldn't even run on it because uh, they would go too fast. You know, and so people had to figure out how to put timers into software to make it work. And... I, I learned programming languages and databases. And so, you know, moonlighting on the side, I would do these projects for people, you know, writing a database to help manage people's real estate um, or, you know, coding, you know, in some kind of contract to help some business owner track something, you know, and uh, I just, but I didn't know how to do business. I didn't know how to price. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I think back on some of my conversations, you know, I, I did this one program, for a, a big company, it saved them several hundred hour man hours of work every week where it was a reconciling error that would happen in their software. And I found a way to print all of the reports digitally. And then I could basically do like an OCR and I could auto reconcile. And within two minutes, I could find the error. Well, it would take four or five days for their best employee to find the error. And then they had to go fix it. And so, you know, now it'd be value-based pricing, but at the time I didn't know how to value that. And I think they paid me a thousand dollars for it. It's probably worth 20, you know, but you know, that's your early stage. You just mm -hmm. try to figure out, you know, what do you do? You, you do what you know and yeah. you try to get better. Now, and you're entrepreneurial. So you're picking this up while you're a new dad. So you have a career uh, going and you're developing businesses. Connect with us on LinkedIn. Be our friend on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Whether jumping out the MP or jumping on the app. You are listening to listening to Beans Cortez. We just want you to leave your mark. So mm -hmm. you and 
April of 2022, find out you have cancer. Yeah. That was now th- th- this is always, um, this is always very crucial. So um, what were your initial thoughts when, or, or, and or where were you when you would find out that you had cancer? My initial thought was I wish my daughter wasn't in the room when they told me. Oh my. As a dad, you want to, you want to buffer your kids. We all say the same thing, you know, you know, we want our, our kids to have a better life than we did. And I went in for a routine colonoscopy that I probably did two years too late thinking this is going to be no big deal. And then, you know, they tell you, we found a tumor in your body. Now, outside of your operation, it, it, it sounded like you did it right away. Um, did you have to go through any more treatments or was the operation well, successful or how did it proceed? So originally, you know, I looked at, you know, different options and I felt like the chemo radiation route wasn't right for me. I wanted to know, can, can you just do surgery? Just cut it out, you know, keep it simple. And, you know, the, they wanted to go a different path. My first instinct was to get a passport and go to Mexico and look for different options there. They were a little bit non-standard for the American process. And then I started treating it maybe organically or naturally. Six, nine months later, did a CAT scan that showed it was gone. But really, that's not the right tool to make that diagnosis. So it was actually misdiagnosed that it stayed. And not only did it stay, it was growing. Mm. And so then in March of 23, I find out that it has been growing and it's now progressed to stage four and it's spread to the lymph nodes in the liver and your lungs are next. So it was getting pretty advanced at that point where you realize you need to do something pretty serious. And so I looked at a lot of different options. You know, the American diagnosis usually is pretty negative and there's really only a couple of options they give you. And then you know, I remember having this really negative conversation with a lady here who is a you know cancer doc, and she's like, "There's a 14% chance we can cure you if we get one or two more lesions on your liver." I can't use the word "cure" anymore. You will not live to be an old man. The chances are you might make it five years. And so then two hours later, I'm on the phone or Zoom call with a doctor in Mexico who says we've actually had really good success with people in your condition. And so that was on a Monday, Wednesday, I was flying to Mexico and Thursday, I started treatment. And within two weeks, they were able to bring me from stage four down to stage two. And then two weeks later, they said, Hey, it's uh, regressed enough that we can do surgery, we can just cut it out, if you want. And so I did surgery and removed it. And at this point, they would say that I'm in remission, I, I would like to say cancer free, but apparently the way it works is you're in remission for five years. They watch you, make sure it doesn't come back. And then after five years, if it hasn't come back, then they would say, okay, we pronounce you cancer free. Wow. Now, where do you stand in the window? Cause this is, we're still in 2023. So you're just what, four, six months out from the story you just shared. Yeah. The surgery was on July 4th of 23. Wow. So how are you feeling now? Well, I lost almost 30 pounds because the surgery had a complication and they had to go back and make a a second corrective surgery. So I spent a little more time in the hospital than they had originally planned. And so I I went from, you know, 175, 180 down to 150 pounds, which was really, really thin on me. And they said, you know, we, we need you putting weight back on. That's like your number one priority. They'll help you heal. And what I've noticed is as the weight came back, my energy went up, my stamina went up. And so at this point, I'm back to my original weight that I was, you know, before I went to Mexico. And I honestly, I feel 100%. You know, I feel very healthy. I drive, I go places, you know, exercise. Like it's my mind. is. You're back. You're back. I'm back back to business like before. Yeah. Now, um, like, that yes. being the case, you're uh, demystifying the success process. What is, what, uh, how do you continue to learn in order to stay on top of what it is you do? I think the main thing for me is curiosity. Like that is the driving force behind me learning. 
So I'll, I'll see situations where, like for example, I worked with a law firm and they were part of a private group of 10 law firms that would meet twice a year. Uh, everybody signed an NDA. We looked at all the finances and you would say, these are the things I'm willing to fight for. These are the biggest mistakes I made. And it was full transparency. And you had to be really honest about what you were doing because they all wanted to share best practices, things that worked, things that didn't work. And these guys would go really hard with each other and say, you know, what you're doing, I don't think it works. We we pay people this way and they pay people that way. And all 10 of them, Vince, they, they all were completely different in how they approached running their law firm. But what was interesting to me was they all got the same net profit. And I thought, okay, how did, how is that possible that all of you are doing it differently, but yet you're all getting the same result when you look at profitability. And so I needed to reconcile that. I needed to understand that just like the eight-year-old version of me asked the question, what's the meaning of life? Mm. And keep in mind for me to ask that question, the answer has to be satisfied that a six-year-old boy can die and the 50-year-old truck driver can live. And so it was an impossible condition, but it had to be satisfied. The question had to be answered. And I think I approach everything that way where I, I want to understand the real reason why things work, not why, you know, somebody may throw up an answer or have an opinion, which is fine. But, you know, in this case, what I learned with those attorneys is there are certain principles and practices that they were all following. They were just following the principles differently. And so in that case, it it's like, okay, then that makes sense. There's some flexibility. You, you, you can have your own culture. You can do it the way you want to do it. But there are certain things that are non-negotiables that I believe you have to engage in. Now, you're a successful entrepreneur and you have a new consulting business and you've worked with quite a few people. Uh, what is the best compliment you've ever received? I was working with a startup accelerator once named, uh, it was called Seed Sumo. We're doing, we look at 1,200 companies a year in order to invest in 10 and then, you know, some of the people that are there, you know, obviously interested in entrepreneurship and especially seed and pre-seed, you know, investment stage, you know, sometimes they were just ideas on napkins. Sometimes they were at revenue. And one of the guys had an idea that he was working on. And, you know, when you, I mean, when you see thousands of ideas a year, it's like you, you can't help but see patterns. And, and I've got Steve-isms is what people call them, things that I say that they, that stick with them. And was listening to him talk, and I said, can I just tweak and adjust your approach? Uh, I wouldn't do it that way. Here's what I would do. And I gave him some advice. And uh, he later said, Steve, save 10 years of my professional career of making mistakes um, and probably can do the same for you. I thought that was a nice compliment. Yeah, indeed. And sometimes people sometimes people will say, you know, I'd, I didn't expect uh, they'll, I'll say something that helps them, which is very flattering, believe me, to be able to do that for somebody. And they, they would say, you know, I didn't expect to learn that from you. And I would say, well, I, I didn't expect to teach you that. I didn't know. <laughs> you know sometimes it just happens. Once the you magic get into happens. It, you know, yeah. There's a magic in there. That's not, not in my control. Well, you brought me to the point in our interview where I asked you, how would you like to leave your mark? I think the thing that I want people to know is because my mission has been to demystify success, to make it not a mystery, is that success is possible for you. And to be able to bring ideas forward that would change the conversation around how people see success in their lives, however you define it, to know that it's possible for you, that it's not separate. I think that would be uh, a significant accomplishment in my life. Very well put as well. Um, Steve, I want to thank you for coming by today and sharing your story. We're going to be praying for you. Uh, I appreciate that. You got, you. you got some stuff in there, like your mindset, it's in your rear view mirror. And you're marching forward like you have the whole time since you were eight years old. So yeah. uh, you're you're quite an inspiration in, in your mental and strength and, and your moral character. So I appreciate you coming by and sharing all of that with us. Thank you. You know, different situations in life will cause you to seek answers to questions that you didn't know needed to be asked. And so it, it's, um, 
it's been a journey for sure. And I'm grateful to be able to share a little bit of that with you here. Then. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. We'll be, we'll be watching for more of the stuff that you're putting out there. You're a busy man. So keep up the good work and we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for listening to Leave Your Mark today. Tune into our next episode of Leave Your Mark with Vince Cortez. Be blessed. You just left your mark. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Listen to more episodes on demand. Just click Leave Your Mark with Vince Cortez.